For today's unit, we're going to talk about sol gel processing. Sol gel is a pretty unique way of making ceramics. Well, not just ceramics, it can actually make a lot of materials. But first, let's talk about what we're going to do. As objectives, by the end of this unit, you should be able to identify just what sol gel is, what are the basics, and especially like what are its advantages and disadvantages. You should be able to calculate uh, density, volume, the, re the reactants that are ne necessary for, to achieve a certain density, etc., of a basic silica sol gel. So basically work your way through the chemistry. You should last be able to evaluate whether or not sol gel will work for a particular application. It's good for a lot of applications, some not so much, and we'll discuss those. Or at least show you some of the ways that it works really well. So, let's take a hypothetical situation. You are working at a biomed company and the mechanical engineers in your group have designed some new prosthetic, some new uh, implant that's made out of a polymer. This implant is supposed to be inserted into a human body. Unfortunately, the mechanical engineers are not bioengineers or materials engineers, and they chose a polymer that causes an inflammatory response, causes an immune response, so that it gets inflammation and pain and general unhappiness. So, it has fallen on to you, the material scientist, to coat this, this part with some biocompatible ceramic. Specifically, you're supposed to use or want to use hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite, uh, that's supposed to be an A, not an E, get rid of that. Hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite is a very hard, strong ceramic. It is the strong part of your bones. And you want to make a ceramic coating of hydroxyapatite in order to coat this polymer. Hydroxyapatite, since it's in your bone, it's already biocompatible, your body's not going to try to fight it, and it gives you the properties you want. Now, in order to make this work, you, there, we have some specific needs that this is going to require. It needs to be pure. It needs to be a pure coating of hydroxyapatite. You can't have impurities because those will cause another in, immune response, and that causes, again, general pain and unhappiness. In addition to being pure, it has to be made at room temperature, or at least low temperature, because otherwise that polymer is going to melt. Last, the process you need, you're going to use to coat this hydroxyapatite needs to be able to conform to a complex shape. That one's actually not too difficult for ceramics, but it's difficult for other uh, materials, so I'm putting it in there. So, powder processing. Can we use that? Well, powder processing is usually taking a mix of the ceramic of a powdered ceramic that you want to coat with or you want to form a shape with, mixing it with some binder to help your green compact stay together, and some sintering aid to help the particles sinter together when you bring it to higher temperature. You press all this together and then you sinter it in order to bond or to get all the powders to stick together and sinter. Now, uh, unfortunately, binder, sintering aid, that, that's not pure. You don't have a pure ceramic anymore. And sintering is way too high of a temperature for your polymer to survive. So powder processing is out. All right, what else can we do? Well, I mean, one of the main ones for ceramics, you're kind of limited in terms of processing a ceramic. The other real way is you can melt cast. So actually melt the ceramic powder to a high enough temperature so that it'll flow. But again, too hot, won't work. So, what can we use instead? Obviously, it's the whole point of this unit, sol gel. Sol gel processing can solve these components. Sol gel is basically a process for forming a high temperature ceramic at room temperature, or at least low temperature, and you're forming it from a liquid, so complex shapes aren't really much of an issue. You have precise control over the purity. In fact, you can make a lot of interesting composites. Um, and you can, it also yields the highest specific surface area, which is a really key term that'll come up later, but it comes up with, can yield the highest specific surface area of any method for processing ceramics. And it is a flexible process. You can make all kinds of different materials using sol gel, and specifically you can make composites that are otherwise not an option, not even possible. And these composites can have very different properties, or combine two materials that have very different properties, even combining organic and inorganic materials, which is really hard to do, because organics require low temperature in order to blend, and inorganics usually require a high temperature processing, and so the two don't mix very well. As an example, bone. 
bone is a composite of a hydroxyapatite, which is a inorganic, and a flexible organic called collagen. That's why your bone can be both stiff and strong, yet be able to survive shocks. All right, let's get a basic definition of sol gel, um, working definition at least. Sol gel is a solution, that's where we get sol, of either a metal or a carbon-based precursor uh, mer unit. So metal or carbon with some oxy organic oxide groups uh, going on. These molecules form mers, as in polymers. So dimers, trimers, if you keep going, polymers. These polymers then link up and cross-link in order to form a stable gel. So we have sol and gel. Now, if we want to look at this uh, in detail, more of like a, uh, a unit uh, inside a beaker. So we have a beaker of our solution, and we have little mers inside. So that's our precursor. Then, as time goes on, these mers cross-link into form one large polymers. Finally, when the polymers link up and when they actually reach from side to side, so now they've reached from one end of your beaker to the other, the solution no longer moves because you have a stiff polymer in there reaching from wall to wall, and now you have a gel, just like jello. It's actually, jello is pretty much a sol gel. So it's one large polymer, and some neat tricks, it is a continuous solid network. So you have a continuous network of solid particles with another continuous network of fluid. So both solid, your solid network and your fluid is in one, in one continuous network with itself. All right, so how do we actually make this? If we were to make a beaker of sol gel, what, what, what goes into it? So let's lay about the reactants. One, the most important one, a metal organic precursor. This is if we're making a ceramic, we use a metal organic precursor. Um, usually it's a metal alk oxide, and it takes the form of whatever your metal group is bonded with some alk oxide, where CxH2x minus 1 is, yeah, you have CH3 is methyl, or it can be an ethyl group, or what have you. It's some side functional group. If we're going to make a silica sol, so if we're making silica di silicon dioxide gel, we're going to use probably one of the most common ones is tetraethoxysilane, uh, abbreviated as TEOS, T-E-O-S, so tetraethoxysilane. The silane part tells you that there's one silicon atom. Ethoxy lets you know that the, uh, the silicon is attached to an oxygen which is bonded to an ethyl group, or C2H5. So silicon, oxygen, and then ethyl group. Tetra lets you know that there's four of these. So let's complete the rest of this unit. That's TEOS. That's our precursor. Now our final uh, shape that we want. Our final molecule is silicon dioxide, which is a bunch of silicons that are bonded to each other through these bridging oxygens. We're not quite there yet, but we at least have our silicon and our oxygens, so now we need to find some way to get rid of those ethyls and bond each oxygen to another silicon. Now, in order to do that, we are going to need water. Water will hydrolyze those ethyl groups, and, it'll, and it will uh, give us a better functional group that we can use to react. Give it a second for the video. I don't know why the computer is doing this. But we can use the water to initiate the, the polymerization, and we can add a trace acid to help the water along to promote the process of hydrolysis. So let's draw back in another TEOS group and then bring water in. Water is going to react with the ethyl group. One of those hydrogens will take the place of the ethyl. And then we have a, once it does, let me draw that in there. So silicon, oxygen, and now we have a hydrogen on the end to make a hydroxyl group. The remaining OH from the water bonds with the ethyl that it just kicked off to form ethanol. And that just floats off into the distance. Now this happens on all the other reactant groups, so we have a fully hydrolyzed silane. Now, this is pretty stable. You can have a bunch of these in solution, and of course there are more than one. There's a whole bunch of these in one beaker and one solution, so let's draw the other one in there. And this is pretty stable as long as there's some acid. But once we add a base in, that promotes condensation. So the base will actually take, allow these adjacent hydroxyl groups to bond with each other and form a water. So now the water gets kicked off and floats off into the distance. And if you look at what is left, we have our silicon and oxygen and a silicon bonded together. And of course, this is happening all over. There's a lot of these. And if we give it enough time, we build our amorphous silicon 
structure. So we have a bunch of silicons bonded with oxygens. Now take a look at that bond that we formed though, silicon, oxygen, silicon. That bond is really strong. That bond breaks at 1200 degrees C. If we wanted to break that at 1200 degrees C, it's a very high energy bond. But we never added any heat. We added metal oxide, water, trace acid, and a base. At no time did we ever apply any heat. This was all done at room temperature. That is really unique to sol gel processing, and it's one of its greatest strengths. Okay. Uh, one point to keep in mind, that hydrolysis condensation reaction, that'll happen as long as there's water present. Um, even enough water, just the humidity of the air will uh, ha will let that happen if you give it enough time. So that's one thing one thing to be careful of as we're if we make sol gels. So let's take a look at what the structure looks like inside our beaker. First, we nucleate little bits of silica. As after we ask, add that base, we're nucleating little bits of silica. Those bits of silica will grow. And then more nucleating sites will probably occur. So we get those original ones, we'll grow into bigger particles. And there's still enough unreacted silane in the mixture to form more nucleating sites. Eventually, though, there's not enough for nucleation, and now we just have growth of those particles. Those particles bump into each other, and when they bump into each other, they join, and then it becomes more energetically favorable to grow the necks, so to make this little space where these two spheres bonded to each other, to make that grow and widen. And what you end up with is a structure that resembles a tangled web of pearl necklaces, is the best description you can give. So that's the structure, and it grows and grows until it's exhausted all of these silane that's in the solution, and then you have your sol gel.